Alrighty, here we go. Good evening, everybody. My name is Brian McCullough. I'm the uh, meeting chair for the Royal Astronomical Society, the Ottawa Centre. And uh, operating the controls here to my right is uh, Chris Terran. Uh, the program that we're, we've got uh, put together for you this evening is um, uh, the result of the contributions of all the people you're going to see up here uh, in the next uh, hour and 40 minutes. And uh, some, a lot of work from uh, Chris Terran uh, and, and my little bit of input to, uh, to assemble the whole, uh, the whole program for you. All right? All right. Lectern light on, Brian. Lectern light? Speak into your microphone. There we go. All right. Okay, so everybody got their cell phones on, uh, on stun? Okay, just a little bit of a warning. I know uh, probably not the most appropriate place to be doing this, but I think it's important that the, the message get out. <laughs> right. No, it, what is this? You, to, you told me this was a real warning, a real safe. Oh. He's got medical types in the family, so I thought it was a real thing. I, what, 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 was I to, what was I to know? All right. Okay, here we go. September 5th already. We're just a couple of weeks away from the, uh, from the fall equinox. Anybody know what, what day the equinox is on? The 22nd. That's the 22nd. This year it's at, uh, what, 11.48 in the morning, something like that? Yeah, it's in, the, it's in the morning. Anyway, so September 22nd, so you've got summer right until then. So if you haven't had a proper vacation or anything like that, uh, jam it all in in the next two weeks, okay, and really enjoy. Okay, let's hit the next one here. So here's the program for this evening. Uh, We've got, uh, okay, you can read there as well as I can, Chuck and Al and Rolf. Uh, now, Simon, uh, I'm not sure if Simon's here yet. Uh, he's uh, just flying in from Whitehorse. He's probably floating in on the raindrops. I hear they had a lot of rain up there. And depending on uh, if uh, Simon is here or not, I've got a presentation. I was just down in uh, London, Ontario to see my uh, daughter, Emily. Uh, she's doing, a, doing her second year of uh, master's astrophysics. So uh, she's doing all kinds of uh, interesting things. All right, so let's get on with the the voice thing. The first thing's first. Starfest 2008. Well, you know one of our uh, great astro imagers in the club, Bob Olson, eh? Uh, he was attending Starfest, and uh, uh, I, I, th I think you can pick him out from the crowd, I think. If I'm not mistaken, Bob, that's you right there? Okay. <laughs> All right. Look who won. He was the winner of the Deep Sky Imaging Contest at Starfest. Yay. And... and winner of the grand prize for, uh, for overall imaging. And I happen to have the awards that go along with this. These awards, I just received these this evening. Well, in fact, I got them from him out in the parking lot, but he didn't want to give them to me, but his wife, Ginny, said, do it, do it, do it. So, Bob, can you come up here, please? That's the image that he won for, the awesome. fantastic one, wow. the Horsehead Nebula. And it says here, Starfest International Salon of Photography, 2008, Robert Olson, Horsehead Wide Field, top image in the Deep Sky Division, and best in show. So you're, you're certainly here. best in show. Around here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like that. I like the way that Jenny does things. That was good. That's a great oh, I've got your envelope here too. I'll give it to you in a minute there, Bob. Does, oh, by the way, can we back up one second? Does everybody know where this is? What constellation is this in? Orion. Orion the Hunter, that's right. So the three belt stars of Orion, right? There's the left belt star, and then you've got one over here, and there's another one on the roof of the museum. So this is really a zoomed in shot. And, uh, and if you look down, you'll see, well, I mean, you have to have quite a big uh, telescope or good imaging equipment to be able to pick out this dark nebula in the shape of a horse's head. Uh, that's uh, silhouetted against the, uh, the light in the background. There's the uh, Flame Nebula, right? Beautiful, uh, beautiful shot on that. The resolution is just wonderful. Well done. Okay, off we go. I thought that um, Rob, uh, Rob, Rick Wagner at the last meeting or a few meetings ago showed us it's not the horse head, it's the other end. Oh, he, oh, Rick, oh yeah, Rick Wagner showed us that it was the other end of the horse last time, but that's Rick Wagner, eh? Is he here tonight? Okay, can we talk? Yeah. Okay, so first up, uh, Chuck O'Dale, just back from his, uh, his travels. There you go, Chuck. Thanks, Brian. Great. Yeah, I just, uh, we just got back, and uh, Brian offered to give me a couple of minutes, so here I am. Uh, Eric, Kajal, and myself, uh, we just came back from northern Quebec to from a little hole in the ground that uh, is kind of semi-famous. Just zoom into it there, Chris. Yeah. 
Yeah, just back up and you see where it's front, where, where exactly where we were. So Eric and I flew up to that general area in my little airplane. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> now, what you, what you have to realize is every one of these images you're just seeing now, all these maps, it looks like a map. Uh, Chuck took all of these over here. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think that Cessna would get quite that high. We had a, a real good thermal that day. <laughs> But we had a trip of a lifetime, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, we, uh, Eric uh, uh, investigated the heck out of trying to get in here. We've tried every method. And believe it or not, there's an airport there now, and it's a park, and you're allowed in. So the park, it's, or the airport itself, is right, yeah, right about where Chris's hand is there. Um, it's not on the Google Earth yet. They haven't updated it. You've got to use the term airport very loosely, eh? That's right, yes. Uh, we'll show you a picture of that uh, some other time, but uh, it's about 900 feet long. I could get my Cessna in there, but I don't think I could get it out. But uh, that uh, walk, the one I'm going to show you in a bit, was the, uh, from our campsite, right where the airport was. Eric and I stayed out in the tent, minus, uh, well, my, my water froze one night. And uh, from there to the lip, and then around and back is just over 19.38259 kilometers, but who counts? <laughs> <laughs> what, what you don't see in there is the boulder field we had to walk across. Yeah, it was uh, pretty interesting. Okay, yeah, next one please, Chris. Or I can do it, can I? Right. Yeah, um, there's, an, there's the boulder field on the rim itself. It just gives you an idea of how big this uh, crater is. These are people over there, and I'm standing here. We're going down, this is about 50 feet down. I'm looking almost straight down this little ravine here. And uh, this, uh, the history of it, uh, back in the 1950s, Dr. Mean from the ROM and a guy named Chubb, he was a geologist, uh, flew up there. Chubb thought it was a kimberlite. He was looking for diamonds. And Mean, uh, being a, a, a geologist, uh, pretty well saw from the pictures that it is an impact, and he wanted to go up there to prove it one way or the other. The proof actually was not confirmed until about the 1960s when impact melt was discovered. So base, actually the 70s, I think. But anyway, from the early 50s through, they rejected just about every other means of making this hole in the ground except for an impact. And they finally did resolve that it is an impact from the impact melt, argon, argon dating uh, 1.4 million years. But from here, Try to throw a rock into the crater. I've done it. Eric has it proof on the video, and the rock got about here. <laughs> I'm getting a little bit older. Let's see. Next one, please. So here's, <clears throat> we're walking, um, uh, the, the cliff, you can see the slope of the cliff here. We're actually walking down to the uh, crater, not the floor. The floor, again, is uh, as deep as the rim is high type of thing. So the water's about halfway. It's actually the deepest lake in Quebec. And we're walking down, uh, there is rumors that it's the second clearest lake in the world, and I just wanted to prove it for myself. So down we went. Next one. Oops, not that one, sorry. Uh, this one I took just to give you a, 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 an appreciation of from the top of the rim, if I stood there, I could not see the crater and I could not see the outside. From this peak I was on right here, it was about the only time you could actually see the inside of the crater and the outside just gives you an idea of the magnitude of the rim here. And again, the depth of the water is from that peak, from that water, down again. So it is a very, very deep. Research has been done on the floor, uh, digging through the sedimentary layers uh, of the history, the geologic and the climate, uh, climate history of our uh, area for the last uh, thousands of years or so because the glaciers never touched that. They actually skimmed over it. So that's pristine sediment down there they can research. Uh, next one. Yeah, here's, here's the lake itself. Look how clear it is. Now, I, as I said, it's the second clearest lake in the world. Uh, the other one, probably the sixth death decimal place, is clearer. It's in Japan. But this uh, is crystal clear. Though This here is about 10 feet deep. Wow. Yeah, it just, just blew me away. Oh, uh, actually, one, one, of the, uh, one of our hikers took his boots off and put his feet in the water just to cool off, and it was too painful. It was about five seconds. That was it. Out he it came. <laughs> it's just barely above uh, zero degrees Celsius. Next one, please. 
And this is an idea of the rock uh, field that we had to climb over. I'm looking straight down into the crater from here. That, now this is a talus slope, which is uh, 25 degrees or so, but the most uh, uh, stable you can get naturally. If you, pile, you just throw, drop a bunch of rocks and they'll form into a, a, uh, a pillar or a pyramid. Well, this, this is the wall of the pyramid. Uh, almost straight, it's almost, I, I'd have to go down on all fours. It's, it, you can't walk down on two legs. And these rocks are very unstable. Some of them, you touch them and they'll, they'll just fall down. So it's very dangerous to uh, climb down this. I think that's the last one, is that the last one? Oh, there we go. And this is an idea looking along the crater, how steep that actually is. I'm going to uh, put an article into Astronauts to show the, the some more geology of it. <clears throat> there was no bedrock uh, uh, displayed uh, in the crater that I could find. There was a couple of parts in the, in the uh, canyons that I took pictures of. But about uh, five kilometers away from the crater, I found a bedrock area. Um, if, you, if you notice in the Gatineau, you see a nice piece of bedrock. It's all nice and smooth in that. Well, this one was shattered from the impact, and it was about five, eight kilometers away. Uh, it uh, gives you an air, a very good indicator of the power of these things when they hit. 1.4 million years ago. Anyway... Uh, is the boulder field related to the impact, or is that just from placement? That, that's a good question. Now, the, the boulder field itself is just local. Uh, uh, it's spread around, and it may be about 10 kilometers away. It's then it's just tundra. So the boulder field is local rocks that were probably shattered from the impact. And of course, the glaciers came by and just mixed them all up. So what you're seeing there is a talus slope of the glacier melt. Uh, the glaciers, as they come, they pick up the shattered rock and move them around a few feet or a few kilometers. So this type of boulder field uh, was from our campsite to here. So Eric and I had to climb over all these boulders to get here. And that, that in itself is, well, it's two miles. And uh, it, it was a hike in itself. But this is very dangerous climbing down. Where I showed you that we climbed down to to get to the clear water was about the only place in the crater you could safely walk down to. But uh, walking around that was uh, an adventure of a lifetime. And Eric, thanks for uh, organizing it for us. Great stuff. Thank you very much. All right, Chuck, that was great. Thank you. Nice. All right. Okay. Al, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. It's a theme. Extricating yourself? Yes, we've got a bit of a theme running here on summer vacations. Okay. Uh, I've come here to talk to you about my summer vacation. <laughs> Seems to be the theme today. Uh, so, uh, my first uh, stop was Marseille, a nice little city in the south of France for a, for a small conference on astronomical instrumentation. There's a nice little panorama I took from up on a hill. Uh, there's some very scenic spots there, but I wouldn't recommend it for a vacation. It was uh, not a very touristy town, if you will. It's uh, one of the dirtier towns in France. But the interesting part that I wanted to talk about, uh, briefly, uh, we went to a field trip to uh, L'Observatoire Haute Provence. Uh, took a little uh, bus trip one day, and uh, there it is from a distance. It's not what you would expect as an observatory on top of a mountain. It's, it's kind of out in the middle of uh, the French countryside where it's hilly but not really mountainous. Uh, so it's a, there's the scope. It's a, almost a two meter scope built in 1958. Uh, you can see it's got a quite uh, a big mount on it. Um, this scope is famous in that it was uh, responsible well, not the scope was responsible, but the people using it were responsible for finding the first extrasolar planet uh, with their high-resolution spectrograph here, uh, around uh, 51 peg. So that's uh, something I didn't know when I got there, but it was kind of neat to see. So it's going to be a bit of a light talk, less science than typically. Just some nice pictures to see. There's one heck of a big counterweight. You got some nice, yeah, some fans to circulate the air in the tube. It's, a, it's all an enclosed tube all the way up, which was kind of neat to see. Big, heavy dome. You go up quite a ways to get up to this. It gets up above the, the ground layer, too. I mean, because you're not in the mountain, I guess. And then here's some other sites from Marseille. Nice little uh, cafe that we went to after seeing the scope. Uh, this, is the, this is the bay at night. And this is up on the hill where I took that panorama. And then the winery, of course. And my second uh, thing I want to talk about on my summer vacation 
Um, I got to spend a week at uh, L'Observatoire Montmagantique out near Sherbrooke uh, for a first light on an instrument that we've been building uh, called F2T2. Uh, it's a kind of a neat name. F2T2 is a Flamingos II tandem tunable etalon that uh, Comdev has been building here for uh, and Professor Roberto Abraham of the University of Toronto. And we were invited up to, uh, to test it out on the, on the telescope up at Montmagantique by the Professor René Doyon of the University of Montreal, who's the director of the observatory and a member of the science team on F2T2. He's also the, the, the primary investigator for the uh, tunable filter instrument on the James Webb Space Telescope, which we're also building here in Ottawa. So this is kind of a, a precursor, I guess, to the space instrument that's going up on, uh, on James Webb Space Telescope to look at uh, first light uh, galaxies. So here is what I, I saw when I arrived at the scope. Uh, I rushed away from another vacation, actually a real vacation I was having uh, with my family. We had scheduled a two-week vacation in early August, and just the coincidence was that the, uh, the week we had in the scope was the second week of our vacation. So I was thinking, oh, it's not going to be clear. I'll stay with the family, and we'll have a nice vacation. Well, wouldn't you know what the weather... I was watching the clear sky clock, and the Saturday night, the first night we had available, showed it was actually there was a little sucker window there. So I rushed all the way from southern Ontario, drove 11, 12 hours, and arrived here around 10 o'clock at night uh, to the scope. It was, it was interesting because I, I got to the base of the mountain, and there's tour buses and people gathering to go up to, to, to do some watching up, some star watching up at the top of the mountain, and they had... Uh, they said, no, sir, you can't go up there. I mean, that's closed off. Only astronomers go up there. I said, well, actually, I'm going up to use the big scope. They said, no, no, you can't do that. You have to go on the bus with everyone else. I said, well, actually, I got the code for the little keypad here, and I went up and opened up the gate, and I said, oh, okay, where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> that, that was kind of This is actually my first major telescope observing run, so I was quite pleased with that. Uh, so, yeah, we actually did have some nice clear weather, so... I went up there and I had the the uh, the lone library uh, 70 millimeter refractor in my in my trunk, and while they were getting the scope ready, I I got that out and I was doing some star watching up there with a the little scope, and all the astronomers were gathered around and we were looking at M57 and all these little things. And it was kind of neat. It was, it was ironic almost with a 1.6 meter telescope in the back. There we go. So this is the uh, 1.6 meter scope at Montmagantique. Um, it's uh, some sort of a Cassegrain type thing. Here's the secondary up on a big spider, and the primary is right here. You can see they've got a little air, air slits in here. These are the, the two finder scope. This is the finder scope here. Um, I think there was another one. Um, apparently, they actually twice a year will allow people to put an eyepiece on this 1.6 meter thing and, and, and look through it. Uh, we didn't have time to actually go look at it, and it wasn't really, really that clear. We only had the one clear night, which was the one I rushed up there. We had about a, a half a night before it clouded up, and of course, at that point, we weren't ready to use the instrument, so it was a bit disappointing. But we got a lot of good time with the, with the dome closed and doing some engineering work on this thing. Um, and this here is, is our electronics box hanging on the side, and the, the filter is in here in front of the Simone... Um, camera, which is a, which is a grism type thing that basically is a spectrometer, spreads the light out. The filter is also a, is basically to look at different spectral lines. So here, here's the Flamingos II Edelon filter that we've developed. We've been working on this since 2005, and this was our first light. It's a 60 millimeter clear aperture filter. Here's the optics. Uh, it's a tandem filter, so there's one here and there's one below that. Uh, an Edelon filter is basically a, an optical comb filter, so it lets through a a comb of wavelengths, uh, a very narrow prongs of, of, of different wavelengths get through each one. And if any of you know what a vernier scale is, this thing operates on the vernier principle. If you operate the two filters at slightly different gaps, the comb, the prongs in the comb are spaced differently between the two of them. So you line up a single line between the two etalons and it blocks all the other secondary lines. So you get a very narrow passband. This thing's been designed for spectral resolution of about 800. Uh, to operate in the J band, which is in the one micron in the near infrared regions, so we're looking at, at light that you can't see with the eye, and the pass band's about you know, on the order of a one nanometer wide, so it's a, like a really ultra ultra nebular filter kind of thing. Um, 
So to scan this thing, we basically have to align the, the passbands of these two etalons to about a nanometer, uh, which, is, which is quite a, an achievement. And we have to hold these, these big glass plates parallel to, to on the order of a, a few nanometers. A nanometer is, is very small. A nanometer is a millionth of a millimeter. It's, it's, it's quite an achievement. So we use actually, there's capacitive sensors in these plates, and this is the electronics box that we use to, to feed, measure the feedback on these things. We use little actuators that are called PZTs. They're piezoelectric crystals or ceramics that will actually drive these things over, you know, fractions of a wavelength of light. So we're basically setting up a resonant cavity in these filters on the order of the wavelength of light and moving them by fractions of the wavelength to look at different regions in the spectrum. We can look at light from distant galaxies. Um, so here's another view of the F2T2 etalon before it had been all boxed up. You can see the two big chunks of silica. The, the plates are really thick because you want to keep them very flat and parallel. You don't want them to distort at all, because if they distort, then you, you, you wipe out your, your throughput. So they're very heavy things. They have these mirror coatings on them, which provides this. This is a spectrum of the F2T2 of the two etalons uh, in ref one, one at a time in reflection. So you can see you have these, this comb filter effect on each of the etalons. What you have to do is you have to change the gaps on them so that just one peak lines up and all the rest don't. So it's quite an achievement to do. You, you can think about the scale of this thing, if you blew up these plates to the size of a hockey rink, say, the gap between them would be on the order of a paper clip. So, but they're much smaller than that, so the gap is also much smaller than that. And the precision would then be on the order of a millionth of a paper clip that we can actually tune this thing to. So it's, it's a difficult challenge, but we're very happy that it's working and we've actually got first light on this thing. Now, the end goal of this is to be installed in the Gemini South telescope down in Chile. And there's a picture of Gemini South up on a mountain in the middle of nowhere. And that's an 8-meter telescope. So we're going to get a lot more throughput on that one than we got at Malmagantic, hopefully. And I'm hoping that I get invited to go down to help commission it. The reason we're put the, the main science goal of this instrument is to look at, in the J-band again, the near-infrared between about 0 0.9 and 1.3 microns, in this, in this region of wavelength, the sky brightness uh, is about 20 to 50 times brighter than it is in the visible. So you've got this haze that you can't get through on Earth. It's very difficult to see things that are dim and distant. So your, your, your background, your sky brightness is very bad. That's why they're building the James Webb Space Telescope to go out in space and get above this atmosphere. And that's why you've got this big six and a half, the big six and a half meter dish on James Webb is to look back to see the first galaxies whose light has been red shifted out of the visible and into the near infrared. So that's the goal of the James Webb tunable filter instrument that we're building. Well, this one, we're hoping to do it from the ground. And the, the reason we think we can do it from the ground is that instead of a continuum in the near infrared, you actually have a line a forest of lines from uh, hydroxyl ions in the atmosphere. So it's not a smooth continuum of sky background. You can actually see between these lines if you have a narrow enough passband. And that's the goal of the F2T2 instrument, is to, is to pick spots in between these lines and look deep into the near infrared, deep at the first galaxies. And we're actually have designed this thing called the Gemini Genesis Survey to look at um, gravitational lenses which will enhance the light from these very distant galaxies. And we're looking for the, you know, these Redshift 10 galaxies that just haven't been seen yet or are expected to be seen, but really there's no statistical information on these things, what they actually are like. So the Flamingos 2 spectrograph is this thing here, and that's what the F2T2 will sit in this hole in the Flamingos 2 uh, spectrometer uh, and then look through this great big telescope. It's actually from the University of Florida. That's why it's called Flamingos. And it's now being undergoing its acceptance testing in Florida, and it's soon to be installed in Chile. Uh, the HIA Institute of Hertzberg Institute of Astrophysics out in Victoria is going to be helping with the integration. They're, they're big into instrumentation, so they're going to be helping with packaging up this thing and putting it on the telescope and getting it set so it works with all the observatory systems. Uh, and so we're going to be using the uh, MCAO instrument on, uh, on Gemini, which is the multi-conjugate adaptive optic system which is being developed. 
And what this is, it's a laser guide star system. I don't know if you ever heard of laser guide stars, but they basically shoot lasers up into the sky and look at artificial stars up there to adaptively uh, fix the mirror so you get a nice uh, sharp image over a large field of view. So this is kind of new technology that's, that's been proven and, and we're hoping to be using that with the uh, flamingos. And just to show you some interesting pictures, this is Bob Abraham, who's the PI. Uh, he was a little bit nervous about whether it was going to work or not. <laughs> this is the first night, uh, installing it on the scope. Uh, this is his grad student, Aaron Mentuk, who's, uh, this is her PhD thesis, to actually use this instrument and uh, hopefully get some good science out of it. So she was actually quite happy that it was working. She's quite smart and she's been quite a bit of help with us getting the, the electronics and the software working. Uh, and this is looking back down from the scope, uh, down the mountain. It's kind of a neat spot. You're driving out in the middle and sh just past Sherbrooke, a beautiful mountainous area. Uh, so this was uh, the first day, and as the clouds started rolling in, very scenic, but not great for astronomy, uh, especially when water or OH ions are, are going to be observing. This is the neat little place that we got to stay, the Pavilion des Astronomes Interdits au Public. Uh, so that was kind of neat. So there, there it is. It's a little uh, house all the astronomers go and sleep during the daytime and, and crawl out at night. It's kind of cool. There's a, there's, a, there's a kitchen in there. It's stocked with goodies and food. And there's a woman who comes in and makes food for everybody three times a week. And it, was, it was really cool. This is the inside of it. We've got a little ping pong table there. Uh, couch. There's a, there's a TV off to the side. You can't see. There's the, the, the scope tech would be using that every night uh, playing video games on, online as the because it was all clouded up. He actually was quite good. He would actually open up the scope even when, you know, there's clouds and stuff, which is very rare. You know, you don't want to have raindrops falling in your 1.6 meter reflector. But he was game for, for, you know, every little sucker hole we could see. So we got a few images of Vega, but that was about all we could see most of the time. This is what it looked like most of the time. It was kind of kind of spooky, actually, you know, about 20 feet visibility on the top of a mountain. It's it's kind of neat. This is the, uh, the visitor's observatory that all the, the tourists got to go and have, have uh, look through while, while we were up in the big scope. And during the day when we were calibrating the instrument, these tours would come and walk through and they'd all be standing in, inside there. And we were in the control room taking pictures of them. <laughs> that was kind of fun. This is uh, actually my observations. <laughs> A lot of fungus and moss <laughs> and mist, so nice trails down the mountain, though. And this is the team. Uh, got Bob Abraham, Aaron Mentuk, myself, uh, Patrick Ingram from uh, University of Montreal. And here's a picture of some fringes from the F2T2 instrument with the calibration lamp. So we're actually tilting the Edelon. You can see all these uh, things. And what you do is you, f you fluff this out so it's one big bright image, and then you go and, and aim it at the sky, and you can scan it. And this is the sort of thing you get when you look at M50, F, M57. This is, these are just raw images. The dots, most of the dots you see here are hot pixels, except for this, this one here, which is a cosmic ray. Uh, but this is scanning through M57 on the Passion Beta line at 1.28 microns. Each image is about 100 seconds through a couple magnitudes of clouds, which is pretty cool. This is a star, I think. And there's a couple stars here and here that you can see, but you really couldn't very, see, very well see the stars. But it's kind of cool. We, we actually scan the wavelength through this emission line of the nebula, and then it kind of disappears. And so that's our first light image, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Yeah. What does your t-shirt say? <laughs> <laughs> to hell with summer, drop the puck. <laughs> All right, Rolf, you ready to roll? Can you see? I can. Well, so this is just a collection of different uh, observations of the past uh, few weeks, I guess, or a uh, month and a half. Um, so it's, some of it should have gone into the observation, but here it is. So, Okay, so uh, one thing that happened... Uh, about a month ago, uh, as announced, we had uh, the planetary workshop, planetary imaging workshop, 
And uh, so it was unfortunately cloudy, so we didn't make any um, uh, sequences that night. But a lot of people brought their own uh, AVIs and um, uh, their laptops, and they sort of we together processed the images. And uh, there it is on the, the big 52-inch monitor, uh, which is sometimes used as a TV as well. And uh, uh, so that was, that was kind of neat. I guess people were able to uh, share a lot of ideas. And I think we all learned a lot of stuff. Uh, so that, that was that. And uh, so we went through like from, a, from an AVI and uh, did all the um, um, uh, sorting through of the individual frames from uh, best quality to lowest quality. And then the uh, uh, software would uh, stack the best ones. And then uh, uh, they'd, uh, after they were aligned, they'd all have to be lined up because the image kind of moves around. And then they get uh, uh, processed using different uh, sharpening techniques to actually get the detail out of the image. So that's what we did. And we, there's, there's lots of different uh, techniques used in, in this, lots of different adjustments. So we discussed the pros and cons of all the adjustments. So even though it was uh, cloudy, we still had the, the chance to, uh, to process some existing AVIs. And it took quite a while, actually, too. So it was, uh, in a way, it was good that it wasn't, uh, wasn't clear. Oh, we had a kind of a barbecue beforehand as well. Uh, so next. Uh, so this was uh, uh, Jupiter. And I guess uh, some of the information that was shared was used in creating this image. So I took this. Uh, the date there, August 22nd. Uh, so a few interesting things. Uh, you can see the great red spot was just coming on to the disk on the upper right. And the lower right, uh, the shadow of Callisto just uh, partially appearing on the disk. And uh, on the left, the moon Io. So Callisto itself was not, was not actually visible. And uh, so uh, altitude of Jupiter, 21 degrees. Very difficult at this, this year to get the decent images of Jupiter because it's very low. So if you looked at it, you see it's always swimming and boiling and terrible. Next slide. OK, so these are, these are two pictures uh, taken about six weeks apart. And the one on the left with the six inch refractor and the one on the right with a C14. So you can see that there's actually not a whole lot of uh, improvement in detail by going to the C14 uh, simply because it, uh, the scene is just so bad and it picks up uh, all kinds of bad scene. But what's uh, interesting to notice here, and I mean this is all luck, it's not, not planned or anything, but uh, you can see that uh, even over six weeks, it turns out that um, you know this was captured when the, f the, the same face of Jupiter was was visible. So the same face of Jupiter. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's very hard to tell because we're just looking at Jupiter's atmosphere. And uh, it's like the Earth. If you look at the clouds, I mean, they're constantly shifting. So the same thing on Jupiter. So, so when it's rotating, you know, it has this 12-hour uh, rotation period. But at the same time, uh, not all the uh, latitudes are rotating at the same speed. So what you see here is you can uh, see the same features. And let me see if I can use one of these uh, pointers here. Uh, for example, this one here is pretty much in the same relative position, this, this dark spot. And even the red spot is sort of in the same relative position. But then you can see that this spot here um, is in quite a different position, right? Um, this sort of uh, group of dark spots here is kind of se uh, separated a bit. Um, this, this dark spot here, which I think is maybe one of the other red spots, I'm not sure. That one is obviously shifted. Actually, this whole, this whole band here, you can see it's shifted relative to the red spot. So you've got this dark spot and then these, this sort of dark area, and it's moved over relative to the, uh, to the red spot. And you can see even in the red spot, there have been some changes, the, this sort of middle uh, dark areas move down a little bit, and in here there's a little, kind of a little white spot that wasn't so obvious there. Uh, right, and then there's these these new dark spots that have happened. So okay, so anyway, so uh, rather than point out everything here, we'll go to the next slide, 
and this is sort of an am animation between the two. So you can you can see, and it turns out just coincidentally that this is the one that it's kind of stationary on, and you can really see uh, the changes that have, that have taken place, the relative relative movement of the uh, of the red spot and and these other bands, and a lot of uh, new features appearing in it. You know, all, all this stuff inside the bands, it changes every day. So you should look at Jupiter every day, every chance you get, because it's always different. Always different, right? Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, right, so uh, I, I guess nobody is showing any pic other pictures of Starfest tonight. So I didn't take any pictures at Starfest either, but the most interesting thing was these windmills. And I don't know if anybody happened to see them driving to or from Starfest. I know some of you were there. But this is a this is a new thing, and uh, so trying to figure out wh why are they here, and everything. So it's a wind farm. There's there's 45 of them, as I found out on the internet, generating a total of uh, 62 megawatts. Uh, here, this uh, some of them are still under construction here. So this one I think is still being built. <laughs> <laughs> That's the latest so, technology. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was qu quite amazing to see these. And uh, one t uh, on the way down, they were turning. Uh, and on the way back, there wasn't enough wind, so they were, they were stationary. But we wanted to stop and see if they made any sound, but we, didn't, we didn't, uh, couldn't hear it because they were uh, stationary that day. Uh, so uh, looking into this, I, I decided to investigate, like, why are they here? Um, you know, why, uh, why this spot? Well, it turns out that this is actually at uh, an elevation of about 500 meters, which is uh, you know comparable to Foy Mount, which is also about 500 meters. So this is actually a fairly high elevation. And it turns out that even Starfest is about uh, 400 meters. So it's a fairly high elevation. And that kind of explains it. I've always found that at Starfest, the seeing is actually uh, quite good. And it might be partly explained by the higher um, uh, elevation uh, there. So that's why they're there. It's windy, high elevation. Uh, seeing might be good there. Next slide. And yeah, you can see they're right, right in the farmland. Uh, so kind of right, right behind people's farms and there's uh, you know cattle grazing all around it and they're, they grow things in the fields there. So it's kind of neat. And uh, next, is there anything else? Oh yes, the, uh, the picnic. So um, uh, a lot of people have been asking about the picnic, and uh, yes, we'll have that uh, next Saturday, um, September 13th. Um, so all the activities there. There's lots of parking when you drive up the hill. Uh, bring your own food, and we'll, we'll uh, put it on the barbecue, and we'll supply some drinks. Uh, we got the museum. You bring your scopes. Uh, trebuchet launching, maybe. And uh, next slide. So this is kind of how you get there. So when you go into the driveway, just uh, just follow the arrow there. It, it won't be on the ground like that. <laughs> so you kind of have to remember to go that way. It's just uh, just turn right and uh, drive up the hill. Just follow the road to go up the hill because uh, uh, it's flat up there and there's lots of parking. Next slide. So this is kind of a map of where we are. Um, so you take 417, uh, exit at March Road or Panmure, and uh, kind of there's the um, Scotiabank place just to orient yourself. Everybody knows where that is, right? And uh, uh, it's a, another closer view. So I guess that's it, eh? Yep, that's it good. for the slides. So there's, oh yeah, so one, one other thing, oh, excitement plus here. Um, we've got a new thing. A new activity going on, and uh, thanks to uh, Richard. Rich is going to talk about this, right? You're going to tell us all about this, this new thing. We're going to have a uh, very exciting game, and it'll just be uh, very exciting. So I can't wait. <laughs> Yeah, he made it sound like as if I'm, I mean, I'm wondering what, what type of game it's going to be. Um, I decided to uh, um, introduce a, a new um, element to the, to the picnic at the, um, at the Myers. It works well with our astronomy club. It's called uh, a game called Who Wants to Be an Astronomer? And uh, we basically break up into uh, two teams, and um, 
There's skill testing questions, and uh, of course, there's going to be a scorekeeper. Um, we might have some visuals as well. It's like a, like a game show uh, based on who wants to be a millionaire. And uh, it's about an hour long. It depends how well we're playing the game, how many fights there are, because sometimes there's a lot of conflicts involved about questions and uh, disagreements within team members. Um, the winners will get a prize, and the losers, well, I won't say anything about that. That'll, that'll be a, a surprise. We, um, we have some ideas. Um, the winners will take the losers by the hand. They'll take one partner, and they will escort them to the Myers pool in which they will be pushed in. So, but we don't really don't know, but it's going to be a surprise. So that's the only thing I won't say about that. And oh yes, and um, April's gonna be making some, some gastronomic um, chocolate chip cookies. cookies. Say the word cookies. cookies. She so, makes great cookies. Yeah, and uh, um, sugar-free, low in sugar, so they're good for diabetics. All right, okay. All right, so we're very uh, fortunate. We weren't sure Simon would get back in. Uh, what, time did, what time did you land? Uh, I landed at 7, but you know Air Canada. It took 45 minutes for the bags to come off. But he's here and he's ready to roll. Simon, where you go. Um, which is the uh, pointer? Bit? It's left and right to uh, the pointer. Yeah. All righty. Well, um, in the, over the past year or so, I guess, uh, I've given you a series of talks about the geology of the outer moons, and I've been focusing very much on, on ice. So tonight we're going to change, as the title indicates, playing with fire. Now, many of us, when we think of volcanism, we think of volcanoes like we see here on Earth. So we're thinking about Hawaii, we're thinking about Mount St. Helens, or if you know your history, you might be thinking of Vesuvius, Santorini, Krakatoa. Whatever. People tend to think of mountainous edifices that belch hot lava out of a hole in the top of a, of a, of a, of a mountain. Well, we as amateur astronomers, we know better than that. You'll recall from my presentations of a few years back on the, the rocky planets that Venus was totally resurfaced by volcanic activity at some time during the past one billion years. Yet volcanic mountains, per se, are relatively few and far between. Now, from your own observations, uh, you know well that despite the presence of lunar mare, which of course are huge lava basins, that the moon itself does not have an overabundance of volcanoes. They're there, but you've really got to hunt for them. Mars does indeed have a few major volcanoes, but they do not account for the ancient basaltic lava that covers most of the planet's surface. So the lesson that we've learned from the, the rocky planets is, one, that volcanism in the solar system can take on many forms. And secondly, that not all volcanism is associated with, uh, 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 with volcanoes, in other words, the pointy things sticking up out of the ground, and that not all mountains are volcanic. Chris, next one, please. So with this in mind, let's take a look at the most volcanically active body in the entire solar system, Jupiter's moon, Io. Now, next one, please, Chris. Now, one look at these two faces of Io is enough to tell you that the surface of this moon is very young and very active. Uh, I, I've indicated here a number of the, the, the main volcanoes, Pele, uh, Loki, uh, Prometheus, you may have heard of these, which I'll be mentioning later in the talk. There's Tvashtar up at the top there, and Cullen down here. And bear, bear these images in mind for the next, minute, uh, the next few minutes, because I'll be using them. I'll stick them up in the right-hand corner of the slides that are coming up, so that you know where on IO uh, uh, the features are that I'm going to be talking about. Next one, please, Chris. And for those that prefer a map, uh, here's essentially the same thing presented in, in rectangular coordinates. There's Prometheus, there's Pele, and here are a few others that I'll be talking about. Emma Kong here, and Toe Hill sits here. Don't worry, I'll be showing you where those are as we go along. Next one, please, Chris. So let's start with an, uh, ironically, let's start with an Ionian mountain that I frankly would have thought was a volcano, but apparently planetary geologists are less than certain. This is called Toe Hill. And you can see where it is. It's down here, just down to the south of, of, uh, of Prometheus there, which is indicated by the P. It stands over five kilometers high. And it sure looks to me as though it's got a major crater at the top. That's what that looks like to me, is a major crater. Now, whether or not Tohill is itself a volcano isn't really very important. What's important is that although Io is a highly active volcanic moon, most of its mountains are not volcanic in origin and most of Iowa's volcanoes do not form mountains. 
You'll see what I mean in just a moment. Let's go to the next one, please, Chris. So here's a 3D image of Tohill, and it's been stretched vertically all right, em to, in order to emphasize the vertical dimension and emphasize the volcanic look to the mountain. Next one, please, Chris. That sure looks like a crater to me, but the, those who know better than I are still talking about it. Next one, please. But the important question here is, when they're not volcanic, how do mountains form on Io? Next one, please. So here, marked by this red ellipse, this is Mongibello Mons. They have wonderful names for these places. Mongibello Mons, it's seven kilometers high. And this image was taken when the sun was very, very low in order to emphasize its three-dimensionality, as you can see by these long shadows here and out, out there and there. Next one, please. Now, what this is interpreted as, this is interpreted as a tilted block of Io's volcanic crust that was pushed up a tectonic fault. This little model here shows there's the surface of Io, and there would be a tectonic fault. And then this stuff would be pushed up the ramp, if you like. And so it forms a, a high point. So it's really, essentially, it's something that was pushed up a ramp. Now, the cones in the background, this one here, this one here, and even this one there, they sure look like volcanoes, but you'll see why I hesitate in just a moment. Next one, please. So here's a, a, another example of a non-volcanic tectonic mountain on Io. Next one, please, Chris. There you can see it indicated by the, a red ellipse. And you can see what looks like a rift valley, this thing here, going around the back and then coming out the top end there. Now, this was also interpreted as a tilted block of crust. But this time, next one, please. The diagram shows us this time the f tectonic fault is going the other way. The top side's going down and the bottom side's coming up. And what actually happens is, is that the mountain block that we see here, this thing has rotated this away and come up to form a, a topographic high in order to compensate for the sliding on this side. So there's the fault round the back. That's this thing. And then there's the mountain. Next one, please, Chris. Now, compared with this, these volcanoes, and these are, in fact, volcanoes on Io, they're pretty flat affairs. So how do we know the volcanoes? Well, because the dark areas here and here turn out to be pools of hot lava. Next one, please. So let's visit some real Ionian volcanoes and see what they look like. Next one, please, Chris. So here with this red circle, you can see this large beast in the foreground. It's got a relatively low topographic relief. It's not exactly the Himalayas here. But I would still call it a volcanic edifice, a, a, a volcano, if you will. And you can see a major channel coming down here off of the peak of the volcano where the lava would have flowed down onto the volcanic plains here that dominate the topography of Io. Next one, please. And again, please, Chris. But look at this one here. That is a volcano on Io, but it's not just flat, it's a hull. It's not a mountain at all. There is no positive relief there. All that's there is this lava pool. Next one, please. Now, here's an aerial shot. I guess I shouldn't use the word aerial. That implies there's air, and of course, on Io, there ain't. So here's a, a, satellite, a satellite eye view looking down on a volcanic center, which is, which is west of, 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 of Pele and south of Loki. And I don't mean the round structure here, by the way, or here. What I mean here, next one, please, Chris. I mean this, this thing that looks like a multi-fingered handprint. And again, there's very little topographic relief. It's more like an asymmetric lava field where the hot, runny lava has flowed like fingers to one side of the volcanic center. Next one, please. And that volcanic center is actually there. And frankly, you can't see anything from the air or from a satellite. And I think the chances are that if you were standing right next to this volcano on Io's surface, you probably wouldn't even be able to see it. Next one, please, Chris. So here's the volcano Prometheus, plus another volcano, which you can see uh, doing its thing here just over the horizon. I think that's Pele, but I'm not absolutely certain. But here's, here's Prometheus. And this, of course, is a blow up. And notice the scale bar here. This is not small potatoes. Um, but it's not exactly a mountain either. And in fact, it's actually more of a lava field. It's really a huge, long, sinuous set of lava flows. Next one, please, Chris. And here's the volcanic center that these lavas flowed out from. Next one, please. 
And that's the path that these volcanic flows have taken. So it's, uh, it's pretty big. But as I say, there's really not much in the way of, of positive relief there. Next one, please, Chris. So no, this one here, this photograph here is not ripples on an Ionian lake, but you could be forgiven for believing that's what it was. These are actually two ages of lava that flowed out of that volcano, Prometheus. So this is a detail, if you like, of that, that, that lava field. The older lavas, which are actually up here, top right, what I've marked as lava plain, um, they're part of the, the lava plain that dominates uh, our Io in general. And the younger lavas, which are down here, these darker things, they actually flowed over the top of them and covered these ridges that look like, uh, like, like um, ripples on water. Now, visually, this actually is an amazing image. But unfortunately, nobody seems to have come up with an explanation yet as to what these ridge-like things are here in the, in the older lava plain. But again, the key thing here is no topographic relief. You don't see a big volcano. Um, next one, please, Chris. Oh, no, well, there we are. We're perfect. So here are two more volcanic structures. Each one of these, there's the scale bar, there's the scale bar down there. Each one of these is 100 kilometers across. Now the first one, first one uh, next please, Chris. The first one is simply a hole in the ground. But it's actually what we call a volcanic caldera. That's that word there, caldera. And what a caldera is, it forms when the magma beneath a volcano escapes somewhere. And the volcanic edifice that was built up on top, frankly, just drops back into the hole that was left behind as the, the magma escaped. The problem in this example is that the magma usually escapes onto the surface as lava. In other words, you can see lava flows. But as you can see around here, that thing looking like a big footprint, there's not much sign of that having happened here. So no one's really sure where the lava went for the hole to form. Next one, please, Chris. And hit it again. And here to the right, we see actually one and two shield volcanoes, real volcanoes, edifices that if you were standing on the ground there and looking towards them, you'd actually see them looking like a mountain. It's, in other words, it's a classical volcano, something along the lines of Hawaii. However, these shield volcanoes are rare on Io. Why? Well, the observed lack of shield volcanoes, plus the very low topographic relief of most of Io's volcanic features, leads us to an in in inevitable conclusion, Io's lavas are not just uh, are simply not viscous enough or not sticky enough, if you prefer, to actually build mountainous structures. Think of trying to pour, pour, pile up warm molasses and actually get them to form a pile that's higher than the plate that you're trying to pile it up on. And you've got a pretty good idea. These lavas must simply have been just too runny. Next one, please. Now, here's a, a wonderful image of the lava field just east, east of that volcano Emakong. Uh, the, the Emakong's over there, and it's uh, just over to the uh, east of Prometheus, which is here. Um, the, 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 there's a, 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 a lava pool right there in the, in the dark grain. Now, again, the topographic relief of this volcanic caldera, which is what this thing here is, is very low. Note the scale bar, though. This is pretty big. That's 25 kilometers, so that's getting on for 50 kilometers across. Now, if we get to the next, the next uh, there we go. You can see here in the red box, we're focusing in on this lava field here. That's the light gray stuff. And if we, if we go to the next one and hit it again, and now you can see there's this squiggly channel here. There it goes, all squiggly up through there. We've seen these on the moon before I've talked to you about these. These are lava channels. And it simply confirms the fact that these Ionian lavas, the lavas of Io, really are very runny. Otherwise, the thing wouldn't have been sort of forming a channel like that. Now, the nature of Io's runny lavas has given rise to a very lively debate over the years since the moon's volcanic character was first discovered decades ago by the early probes that went out to, 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 to look at it. Because of the colors of the lavas, they're white, they're orange, they're red, and they're black, you'll see that, well, you can see those colors up there. People thought that the principal component of this volcanic material had to be sulfur. You all know sulfur. Sulfur generally is yellow when you see it in a high school laboratory. The trouble is that this would have made Io unique in the solar system, the only body, frankly, to be belching sulfur out of its volcanic uh, 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 systems. And in science, pretty well in general, special cases are always suspicious. So more recent data from the probe Galileo, which was up there a, number of, a few years back, 
I guess this is where I take a breather. I'll keep going. I think I can talk over this. Has shown that these lavas actually erupted at very high temperatures, more like 1600 degrees centigrade, and that's way too hot for sulfur. Sulfur just couldn't exist as sulfur at those temperatures. So now they think that Io's lavas are made of a very magnesium, the same stuff as you put in those mag wheels on, 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 on fancy sports cars, a very magnesium-rich silicate composition called komatiite, and that word is spelt down here for those of you that can see it. It's named after a small village in South Africa where, the, these, where these were first described. And this very runny, very hot lava was very, very common on Earth about three billion years ago when the interior of our planet was much hotter than it is today. Next one, please, Chris. Okay. Let's move over here to look at Loki. Here's Loki. Loki's right there. There's, there's Pele. Loki is one of the more celebrated Ionian volcanoes. Once again, go to the next one, please, Chris. Huh? Is it oh, sorry, that, that's, that's, that's Pele. Did I say Prometheus? No, you said Pele. That is Pele. This is a, 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 a sort of horizon type view of, of this area here, which is this area here. And you can see there ain't no relief there. There's no topographic high. So although it's pretty large, the structure, there's how many hundreds of kilometers? That's 200 kilometers down there. That scale bar is 200 kilometers. And yet still, we're looking at no relief with this gigantic volcano. Next one, please, Chris. And this dark area here that dominates Loki is a giant lava pool. That must be the better part of 100 kilometers across. Now, when this image was first seen, some planetary scientists interpreted these relatively smaller blocks here. You see there's a large white block in there. Then there are these small ones. Actually, there are little small ones out here too. They thought these smaller uh, 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 blocks of, of light-colored material, they thought they were floaters, rather like icebergs being carved off of a, of, of a, of a large uh, glacier. And they thought they were floating around in the lava. Well, luckily, cooler heads then prevailed, and these are now seen as islands of older, crystallized lava that are poking up through the lava pool from the lava pool floor. Next one, please, Chris. So here's the most famous Ionian uh, uh, volcano of all. It's famous today, but maybe a couple of hundred years ago it wouldn't have been, and maybe in a couple of hundred years it won't be either. And you can see it's, it really stands out because it's surrounded by this ring of red ash. This red ash, by the way, is quite recent. We'll come to that in just one second. The reason for the ring is the absence of any substantial atmosphere around the moon. This means that erupted ash coming out of the volcanic center right there meets no frictional resistance as it's in, uh, uh, as it's actually... I keep wanting to say, as it's in the air and about to sort of fall on the ground, as it's up above the surface, there's no frictional resistance. So the only thing that slows the ash down when it's been erupted and pulls it back to the moon's surface is gravity. So the outcome of this is that you end up with a plume of ash that has the shape of an umbrella. And that erupted, that erupted ash all falls at a certain given distance from the volcanic center, hence you get this ring of ash. And no ash falls in there and none falls beyond. Next one, please, Chris. Well, that's just, just telling you where Pele was. And here's the reason why Pele is, 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 is celebrated today, but it might not have been 100 years ago, and it might not be 100 years hence. It's, it has erupted extremely recently, and that red ring was extremely recently developed. The volcano itself is just beyond the horizon, and that's why the ash plume here looks very complicated. We're partly looking underneath it as it's coming towards us. But this was an absolutely spectacular image that I couldn't not put in the talk. Next one, please, Chris. OK, so we've toured a number of major volcanic features on Io, but how do we know that they were once made of hot lava? And what do we mean by hot on a moon with no atmosphere and therefore no insulation? So this is Amirani. It's located up here. There's, there's a Prometheus. And it's the largest lava field anywhere in the solar system. And next one, please, Chris. And here's Amirani as seen by an infrared camera, or at least there's the infrared camera image. Now, um, next one, please, Chris. Now, infrared radiation is heat. So hot spots in the bright colors there, they represent the most recent lavas because they're hot. Now, while there are clearly two very recent volcanic centers in this lava field, we have to conclude that there are multiple warm centers. You can see them there, warm, not so hot. And that implies that, that, in fact, you've got volcanic centers. These are older ones. These are more recent ones. But all the way along the length of this entire volcanic field. 
Next one, please, Chris. And the same thing can be applied to a volcanic caldera. Remember, a volcanic caldera is a hole, in, a hole which the volcanic edifice has dropped down into. This is Tupan. It's about 50 kilometers across, and it's a lava pool with recently erupted hot lava to the north. You can see that because there's the hot, hot spots in the infrared image. Same scale as this image down here, which is this one here and smaller. And that's in the north. And you've got older, warmer, probably, re probably crystallized lava down in the south. That's what this stuff here would be. Now, it's worth noting here that this cliff you see here along the north side of Tupan, it's in the shadow, it's casting a shadow. And that cliff is a kilometer high and is absolutely vertical. Next one, please, Chris. And finally, this is volcanism caught in the act. Next one, please. This is Tvishtar, a volcano, and it's up there, and there again is Pele for, uh, for, for reference. It's way up to the north there. It was caught erupting lava fountains. They're huge sheets or, or, or um, uh, curtains, if you will, of, of lava, and it was erupting in 1999 in November. That's what you see down in this image here. There's the eruption. You can see it very, very bright. You can see the lava itself. Next one, please, Chris. And hit it again. By February of the following year, three to four months later, the first eruption had ended. There we go. The eruption has now ended. And the site of the volcano, or the eruption rather, had moved. Let's hit the next one, please, Chris. And again. There we go. It's moved over to here now. So, again, note the scale bar. This is 50 kilometers. These are pretty big features. So, yes, we do indeed know that Io erupts hot lava and not some mysterious substance, and it does so all over the moon, and it's doing so today. Next one, please, Chris. So, just how hot is Io's surface with all this volcanic activity taking place? Now, aside from the actively erupting lavas themselves, which attain the temperatures of 1,600 degrees centigrade, Io is actually pretty cold. The infrared image here, which is at the scale of the, in, the entire moon, tells us that even standing right on top of the most recent active volcano, the surface temperature would be a chilly minus 100 degrees centigrade. In brief, Io is not some lost uh, cousin or lo long distant cousin of super hot Venus because it has no atmosphere to provide th thermal insulation. Maybe volcanic is the most active body in the solar system, but it's damn cold. Next one, please, Chris. I think this is the last but one. So what powers all this volcanic activity on Io? Given its slightly elliptical orbit and the systematic gravitational tugging that it's subjected to by both Jupiter and the other Jovian moons, Io's interior is flexed, rather like a rubber ball. If you just pick up a rubber ball and squeeze it, that's what Io's going through. And this flexing is referred to as tidal flexing. And this is the rock equivalent, if you like, of tides that are raised on the Earth by the moon and the sun, but ocean tides, but this is tides in the rock itself. And all this flexing results in work, and that work is then converted to heat. Now note, this is not heat due to friction. Frictional heat is what you get when you rub two sticks together like Boy Scouts trying to make a campfire. This tidal heating is more like what happens when you rapidly bend a copper wire back and forth, and the bent part of the copper wire heats up. La last slide, please, Chris. OK. Now, in several of the talks that I've given in this mini-series, and I don't know if I mentioned that at the beginning, but this is the last in this mini-series on, the, uh, uh, on, on uh, the outer moons of the solar system, I've shown you several examples of cryovolcanism. In other words, the eruption of water or slushy ice on moons, such as Saturn's Enceladus, which is indicated here. And you may have heard recently people are getting excited about these tiger stripes, which is where we're getting this, this, this icy volcanism occurring. The point I want to leave you with here is that this ice volcanism, although it occurs at much lower temperatures than the volcanism on Io, still requires heat. And that heat is derived from the same source as Io, tidal heating. Yet there is a, lo a lot of discussion right now about focusing that tidal heating perhaps in these faults here, which is what gives rise to these blue tiger stripes. But it's still the same phenomenon. It's just more focused. So the take-home message here is that volcanism is a common phenomenon throughout the solar system. However, it's a very diverse phenomenon that we're just beginning to understand. And it's one that involves materials ranging from molten silicate rock to water ice mixed with ammonia, in other words, cleaning fluid. Io just happens to be the most spectacular example. Thank you for listening.
I mean, even with the, um, the right lava, wouldn't you expect the, uh, the lava to solidify very quickly because of the temperature change? Uh, yes, you would. The, oh, sorry, yes. The question was, this runny lava, wouldn't you expect it to solidify very quickly? Because, of course, it, as it comes out of the volcano, it's coming into very cold conditions on Io's surface. It's absolutely true. But what actually happens is very similar to what happens in, say, Hawaii. Some of you may have seen these documentaries of the lava pools in Hawaii. The surface is a thin crust. In fact, there are these beautiful images of the crust moving around and being swallowed as the, the lava boils and bubbles. Well, what happens is, is these lavas, and we see the same thing on the moon, and in fact, we see the same thing on Earth. As the lavas come out, the outer part of the lava freezes, and that then holds the heat in for the interior part. And hence, this lava can flow hundreds. On the moon, we know that it's, you can see it with a small telescope. Schroeder's Rill, for example, on the moon, I think it's 250 kilometers long, and that is a long lava tube. So it's the same kind of thing here. The outer part of the lava crystallizes, and it insulates the inner part of the lava that can just keep going. That's how that works. That, that, that probably was, uh, was, was Pele. That was Pele. Yeah, yeah. They know that Prometheus has erupted quite recently as well. But the really spectacular ones, as you can see from the size of that ring, when the, when, when, when the umbrella of ash came up, that was really spectacular. It's hard to believe it's been 30 years, almost 30 uh -huh. years. Well, don't forget, you know, and I've said this time and time again about, for example, uh, the, the, the recent work on Mars. We really learnt an enormous amount 30 years ago when those initial probes went out, both to the local so inner part of the solar system and the outer part of the solar system. Things like Cassini and so on are doing absolute wonders today, but we mustn't forget just how well we did with our old technology 30, 35 years ago. It was absolutely spectacular. Sorry, just before I let you go there, Chris, can you pop up? A couple of things I noticed. Uh, this face here. Face of Julius Caesar. You've been watching the series Rome on TV. There's his crown, there's his mouth, his nose, and his eye, right? But there's an even better example. Chris? Can I see the pointer there, please? Do you see the boy in the cap? Right? There's the peak of his cap. There's the back of the cap. Might be a girl, right? The it must be a girl because there's she's wearing a boa. There's the eye, the nose. Oh. Wearing a what? A feather boa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And there's the shirt coming down, hand in the pocket, there are the pants. Amazing images. Actually, don't, 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 don't be too hard on Brian. Chris, can we go back, back to that image again? Because when I first looked at this, uh, that to me looked like a groundhog coming out of the ground. <laughs> the ears, the eyes, the nose, the little paws. It's not just Brian, all of us do this. That's why, that's why we think there's a man in the moon. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> Simon, uh, thank you very much. This has been a wonderful series that you've done over the, uh, what, about the past, uh, the past year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just an amazing uh, series of presentations, and uh, I know it's an enormous amount of work that you've done. And uh, I, I, for one, and I think everyone else has really appreciated uh, what you've done. So uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, this is just a uh, brief message from our sponsor, um, as I put on my museum hat. Um, yes. School has started. You have spent huge quantities of money getting the little, uh, the little ones back, and the little yellow freedom machine has arrived at your doors and all that <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah. Anyway, so it's also an opportunity for you guys to get to get back yourself. And uh, this year's run of programs is ready. And naturally, of course, the Dead Tree edition of the brochure is not available would make perfect sense for me to have it here for you, which is probably how come I don't have it. But at any rate, uh, however, it is available on the website, actually, which is, in fact, where Chris stole this one just uh, about an hour or so ago. So uh, this is the same uh, program that we've run for a long time. Um, we do update it to keep track with, uh, you know, stuff that, stuff that happens. But uh, again, it's the same thing for our routine programs here. Um, the only assumption is you're interested. And uh, this, at this beginning level, there's no assumption of any kind of background whatsoever. So uh, certainly a lot of folks in here, this is not going to be anything you're going to particularly want. But if you've got friends who are just trying to get going on it or, uh, you know, nieces, nephews, friends, grandkids, whatever, uh, pass this on. And um, 
I have no idea who will be doing this. Could be Brian, could be me, could be Paul, could be any of this, but uh, you know, you know how we're, you know what we are, we're all crazy. So uh, anyway, give it a thought. And uh, that's it. That was my little pitch for the place. So uh, do wander by. Thank you. Have a good thank, one. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Okay, I've decided I'm gonna squeeze mine in here. I'll squeeze it in. All right, we're gonna, and we're gonna follow this up with observations and observing challenges. Uh, I was just down to, uh, as I'm mentioning at the top, Went down to London, Ontario. There's the Tower of London. Uh, went down there to see my, my daughter, Emily, who's doing, she's starting her second year uh, uh, master's astrophysics. And uh, I'll show you what she's been on to. Okay, Chris? All right, so if you don't know where London, Ontario is, and I discovered this when I went down there, there's London. The uh, observatory that I'll be showing you, one of the observatories I'll be showing you is in Delaware, which is just down from uh, just southwest of London, all right? So here's the uh, facility, one of the facilities that the U University of Western Ontario operates. It's a LIDAR facility, so it's a laser. And they shoot a beam of laser light straight up. And what they're doing is they're, they've got a big uh, liquid uh, mercury mirror telescope. And uh, they, use, they use the laser light to examine particles in the atmosphere. So that's what, that's what they're doing with that. That's my little car right there. Uh, and we go in and they, they always go down with, uh, if they're going to the facility, it's always required that they have, have two people there because it's uh, some distance off from the, uh, from the city. And uh, they tend to lock themselves in just for a bit of security there. Uh, in the background, that's where the, the telescope is in the back room and the laser is in here and the laser light gets pumped out to the uh, telescope room and it gets shot up straight up here. So you can just imagine there's the laser light going up. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, looking from behind, this is on the other side of the observatory, uh, looks like there's, I don't know if this is old radio astronomy antennas that were set up in the back here. Okay, we'll go to the next one, please. I was fortunate uh, when Chuck was on his way back from the, uh, from Angava, looking at the crater there, I caught him just flying past the observatory here. <laughs> Sorry, Chuck. Okay. All right, there's, there's the bean, there's Emily. Uh, playing with her laser, now they've, they just had somebody in from, uh, from California to replace some of the uh, uh, crystals in, the, uh, in one of the lasers here. And it's a, I'm telling you, it's a, it's, it's a Meccano set. Nightmare. And what, they have to, what she had to do is line everything up. They had to replace a, uh, a crystal in one of the lasers uh, because it had become burnt out. If the, lasers, if the laser light isn't entering everything just the right way, it can burn the crystal. So they had this guy in. If you, th the reason they bring him in is if, if he uh, messes up, the, uh, the crystals cost, uh, I think they were five or six thousand dollars a piece. So Emily watched and she says, I could do it in the next time, but she didn't want to have to, she was a little bit nervous about maybe having to go through a couple of trial crystals getting up to uh, a level of expertise, right? So she's looking at the lineup of everything, and uh, so she's the one that's been responsible for getting their, their laser, their laser uh, back online. So she, uh, there's a whole light path that goes through there. Well, let's go to the next one, please, Chris. Uh, her, uh, her, her boyfriend, Chad, is now uh, with her in London, so she's, uh, oh, she's happy as a peach about that, uh, Linda, you're, in case you were wondering. Uh, just, just thrilled about that. He was able to get into Halifax, so they're, they're settled now in, in London. So they're, uh, they're having a look. We've got the, we have to wear the glasses when the laser light's uh, going along there. Chris? This is the, uh, I got to play with this, You're right? You start, open the shutter, switch on, then switch off. Of course, I'm doing it every command at daughter's, daughter's instruction, right? Okay, we'll go to the next one. Next one. There I am in my Cool Joe glasses. And we'll see what we've got here, okay? All right, so here they are starting. Uh, they get the first beam started up. We'll go to the next one, next one, and again, and again. Can you back up through those at the same speed? And let's walk through them again. Okay, away we go. We'll go to the next one, yeah. So time to readjust. So here she is. We, I asked her, how long are we going to this LIDAR facility for? She said, oh, I said, like an hour or two? She goes, yeah, a couple hours. Well, we were there, we were there six and a half hours while she got everything lined up. Let's go to the next one. Harder work and time to test again and success. She's got a little sheet there. Uh, she puts this little uh, burn sheet in front of the, uh, in the laser path. 
to make sure that it's going through the, uh, she can then see if it's going uh, centered through the, uh, through the optical uh, path. Okay, let's go to the next one. There she's in the uh, telescope room now. This is a uh, liquid mirror telescope. That's, that's uh, basically a, a, a pan of uh, mercury, all right? I'm on one side of the glass with Chad. She's on the other side. And the reason she's on the other side and we're on this side is, if we go to the next one, she's all masked. She's got her mask on. Uh, later, we were able to go in when she opened up the, uh, the roof of the observatory and all the fumes went out. She's got a counter right here so she can t tell what the levels are, uh, mercury levels in the, uh, in the atmosphere there. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Looking down at the mirror. And it's a wonderful thing. It actually had a couple of, uh, it's almost like there were chunks. You'll see a better picture of it in a second. Chunks out, out of the mercury. It's uh, quite viscous. Okay, we'll go to the next one. That's the cover for this, which they never put on because I couldn't believe how many flies and uh, uh, spiders and everything else were in that uh, observatory. Okay. Okay, so there I am down at the bottom. I'm now in that room which, uh, without a mask, everything's been clear. We're seeing, looking down into the telescope, seeing the reflection of the sky. All right, and now if we go looking up the pipe, there, now we're looking up that tower. And this tube, this is where the laser beam comes from, the, uh, the laser room on the other side. So it goes through, bounces up, and gets reflected along this tube. And if we jump to the next one, uh, this is the, on the laser table, this is the, these are the last stages before the light gets shot up through the roof and then one more uh, reflection to go down that black tube. There's the tube coming out now, and it hits here. And if I've studied my notes correctly, we'll go to the next one, studied my notes correctly, the light's coming out through here, and then pshh, straight up into the atmosphere, and it's a telescope then that examines that laser beam in the sky to see what the, uh, uh, what the particles are in the, uh, in the atmosphere. Okay? Okay, we're back on campus now, and it's a, has anybody been to Western Ontario, University of Western Ontario? I think, yeah, it's huge, it's huge, all right? So uh, there's uh, Emily and Chad. Uh, on campus, if we go to the next one, they also have the uh, Hume Cronin Observatory. So. So there it is there. It's still, it's hard to see in this picture maybe, but do you see it's basically greenish with a bit of orange, a uh, bit of orange splotches and one black eye, another black eye and a black nose. That's of course uh, the Halloween prank that uh, somebody did, somebody does each year. They climb up and paint the dome like a pumpkin and then put a jack-o'-lantern face on it. <laughs> All right, we'll go to the next one. So I asked a passerby to take our, take our photograph there. And uh, let's see what this thing is here, right here, Chris. That's what that thing is right there. Emily was thinking, she tried steering it around. I think it's a, she, I think it's a, she's training to be a professional astronomer, which means what she knows about things like this could be suspect. Anybody, any guesses on that? Some, it looks almost like a sundial, but there's, but there's no gnomon really to be casting the shadow the right way, but unless, it's a neat historical astronomical artifact is what it is. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> All right, there's the entranceway to the observatory. So Emily opened it up uh, especially for, uh, for Daddy-O to have a look. There's the man in the picture. That's uh, Hume Cronin. Okay, he was a great, uh, he was the main benefactor to, uh, to allow the observatory to be built. And it's, and it's nice, they've got a nice uh, space in there. If we, if we had a very small astronomy club, this would be perfect for our meetings. If we had, if we had 35 members in our club, all right, which would mean about 100 people would have to shove off tonight. Right? The rest of us then, we could sit in here. They've got a nice screen there. The, uh, the tel yeah, ter yeah, terrible commute. The uh, telescope platform is next deck up, okay? All right, so now we're on the, the next, uh, next level up. And so what they've got is a 10-inch uh, a, uh, Perkin Elmer refracting telescope. So it's a, uh, and they've got the um, uh, astrograph. Is it the black one or the blue one? Any idea? One of these two is the, is the astrograph where they can, uh, or the, sorry, the Schmidt camera, where they can take uh, special photographs. You think it's that one? Okay. I think it's this one. We'll see in a minute. Let's go to that. Let's see what else. All right. So the dome controller is just on the other side of this little protective bar there. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. Looking down, so, yeah, hard to say, isn't it? Well, we know it's not that. That's not the Schmidt camera, okay? So it's one of these two. <laughs> All right, so I'm looking up. 
And it looks to be a, a, a wooden dome on it, but I think they've got some, uh, some metal cladding on it. There's the, the eyepiece end. Obviously in need of a bit of uh, paint. One thing I like, they, they've got handles on this telescope and uh, it's something we could use on our big refractor out here because it gets a bit hard to, and you're always, people are pushing from the eyepiece to try and steer the big scope around. So Tim, maybe we can see about getting handles on our scope, right? Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, and we'll go again. And they had to open up a drawer. They've got these old star charts there. They're, you know, I think uh, you know when some of the early explorers to Newfoundland had these uh, on their chart tables. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. Now this thing here, does anybody know what that is? It is. Is it a Herschel wedge? Okay, that's, uh, I was describing it to Glenn on the phone. He's, and just from the sounds of it, he says maybe a Herschel wedge. So what does a Herschel wedge do, I tell him? It's used for solar observing. For solar observing. See, now I looked at it because you can actually, when you look down the eyepiece, you can see through this. And I kind of thought, well, maybe it is for solar and what you can do is make multiple images of the sun. No? It's just for heat? Oh. Okay, so it's basically reducing temperature in the... Uh, Okay, so okay, so you just you okay, all right, okay, that's great. Thank you. How about that eyepiece box? <laughs> now that belongs. To, that was in a little side room. Actually, it, right next to this was a uh, there was a uh, an old uh, I think a Coulter ten inch uh, Odyssey uh, scope uh, Dobsonian uh, owned by London Center RASC. But inside, the, this is the, uh, uh, the observatory's equipment here. And all these old, these are all, uh, these are Perkin Elmer eyepieces, these ones here, right? And you can see, they, they must have been around for 100 years. All right, let's go to the next one. A couple of doodads uh, kicking about. And the next one. And this, I saw this in the side room, so I asked Emily and Chad to haul it out so I could take a picture of it. And I'll show you more about this in a, in a few minutes, but it's a nice, uh, interesting image of the moon. I wish I'd ha taken a, a sharper photograph of it, but it had a bit of a plastic over it, and I think that's what uh, maybe tricked my, my focus around it. And I'll explain more about this in a, in a couple of minutes, okay? And there's daddy and daughter. And I think that's it. Hey, not bad, okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. So off we go to the uh, observations portion of the program. All right, and who's up? Hugo, did you want to talk about this? Okay, I didn't really expect that I'd be up here talking about uh, I mean, but what I saw with my naked eye. Uh, how many of you uh, actually were out there and saw some of the Perseid uh, meteors? Saw a good number of you. Well, actually not, not a good number, just a sprinkling. Anyway, uh, we have a camp in, um, in Michigan, near Kalamazoo. Uh, yes, there is a place, Kalamazoo, not just in a song. Um, and uh, one night when we were wrapping up, I remembered it was uh, that the Perseids uh, were supposed to be at their peak. Uh, so around uh, 12.30 in the evening, uh, or I should rather say, uh, the morning of the 12th, um, we looked up and I really didn't expect to see too much. Uh, I saw a couple of little things, and uh, then lo and behold, I saw some uh, qu quite long tracks, longer than I'd ever seen before, um, about, uh, I'd say about four of them. Some of them lasted quite a while. And stand back just yeah, okay, stand yeah. back a bit. Okay, some of them lasted uh, quite longer than I expected because my friend was looking the other way. I was looking mainly towards the south, southeast. And I saw most of them, and she wasn't seeing any. And then she said, oh, there's one now. And uh, I slowly turned around. I, I could still see the tail end of it. So it, uh, it's, it spanned quite a bit of time and space. Um, but the, the, uh, the thing that I'd never seen before, and I, I, I think it's fairly unusual, is there was one long track I saw which uh, split in two and went on parallel, equal brightness, and it must have spanned at least uh, maybe 15, 20 degrees. And uh, so, uh, and they simultaneously ex ex extinguished as well. Um, 
So um, it, and it seems it, it, it's our uh, time for uh, summer vacations as rent vacations because uh, I was working a workshop there. <laughs> um, but uh, Brian also mentioned his uh, super laser there. Uh, a couple of days later at the camp, uh, one of the, uh, we had a professional astronomer visiting there and showing some of the kids uh, some things in the sky with a small telescope. And he had with him a little green uh, laser that he pointer that he pointed up. And uh, even though it seemed to be relatively clear atmosphere, you could see the, the track. So you could point at different stars and point things out. And he, he gave it to me, and I was sort of trying it out. And then I said, oh, well, and then, and then there's an airplane there. He said, no, 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 you mustn't do that. That's, that's illegal. Since I was in, a, in the US, maybe they, they'd bomb me or something. Did, did, so did you shine it at the plane? Well, it was, well, it was not a very powerful thing. And uh, it was way up high. Like, it wasn't like a low flying thing oh, yeah, yeah. or anything. Yeah. All right, here's your little oh, well. observing token. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, thank you, Hugo. Oh, that's a federal felony. <laughs> <laughs> stop, stop felon, yes, yes. All right. We recorded his confession. <laughs> uh, Brian. Here he comes. Anybody want anything for him? 50 bucks. There we go. Each. So I don't know if this really classes as an observation, because I just thought it was a pretty picture. That's an observation. <laughs> so this, is, uh, this was taken at, uh, at FLO site, but it's not taken on the, on the, on the scope itself. Um, this is a with a Canon SLR, a 20 millimeter uh, wide angle lens. And uh, it's an eight minute exposure on a, on a used uh, um, uh, equatorial mount that I bought at the swap table. So come to the swap table. There'll be one in December. <laughs> anyway, so I just took it because it's a pretty picture. And if anybody's confused, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Kila's over here, so this is Altair. Uh, Lyra's down here, so that's Vega. Um, this is Delphinus. And Sagita's here, and part but not all of um, uh, Cygnus is over there. And if somebody can tell me why it's not the way you'd normally see it, you can tell me afterwards. That's what I was going to ask you now, but oh, okay. That's all right. So there, there's a reason it's quote upside down, and that's because the camera was quote upside down. Um, the mount that I'm using has only one orientation of its uh, finder of the polar alignment scope. Oh, are you going to? Uh, what? No, rotate you on? just don't let us interrupt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Brian. Yeah, yeah, it's per it looks perfectly normal. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, Brian, here's your observing token. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Okay, thanks. Um, about a year ago, I was able to acquire Glenn LeDrew's old camera tracker from Attila Denko. And it took about a year for me to finally get the thing out and use it. Well, this past Sunday, I was a uh, guest speaker at the K-Way campsite at Thousand Islands Ivy Lee, and I do this about three times a year, so last Sunday was phenomenal night, but there was a lot to do, so I couldn't really photograph. I tried one or two photos, but the lens just, just fogged up like crazy. So um, on Monday night, I called uh, Linda and Rolf and asked if I can borrow their sky, since they have dry conditions, and uh, I, lo and behold, I, I did set this up and got some pretty good, decent uh, photography. Uh, just quickly, um, just set up on a regular tripod. Here's my Canadian Tire uh, battery, the eliminator, and uh, Glenn's mounts over here. Next slide for a close-up. Um, the Canon Rebel XT, which is the camera for astrophotographers. Um, Glenn makes some real phenomenal stuff. There's actual um, a little porthole here with a with the lens, uh, with with a circle in it, and has a, s a smaller circle to one side where you put Polaris in. So to really find Polaris is almost a cinch with this thing. It's very nice. And as I said, some pretty good results. Here's uh, from Ralph's driveway, uh, because I do want to get the, the southern sky too. Uh, here we have Caspia the Queen, uh, the double cluster. And here we have M31. And this is about an eight minute exposure, taken at um, ISO 800 film. 
Now what I did is I photographed in black and white, just like Brian did. But again, I didn't like the results. I got that kind of brownish tone to it. So I just removed the color, got black and white, and that's more a realistic view than what you see in the sky. Can you tell us what M31 is? Right here. Or you thought it was a meteor. Maybe not. Right. OK, next slide, please. Uh, looking south, oh, that's really, really wide. OK. It's not I, upside down, is it? Oh, no, no, it's, <laughs> it's no, it's, it's down? I'm sure I did. Anyway, um, yeah, here we have Jupiter, uh, the Lagoon Nebula, and I did have all of, of uh, the teapot down here. Yeah, you got it. You got it. You're just, you're oh, okay, I'm, I'm not Can I point for you? Um, no, no, I got no, it. You got it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, it contacts, and from far, yeah, okay, sorry. No, but from here, it looks a lot bigger than what it was. I thought I shrunk it down. Yeah, the teapot, the handle, the spout. He comes out here, M22, um, M7, six. six. Gary, you want to keep on going? There's a lot in here, a lot. Um, again, just, just with the regular um, 18 to 55 millimeter uh, telephoto, um, telephoto lens, just as much sky as I could. And of course, the heart of the Milky Way is just about over here. And the last slide is Milky Way North. Here we have Cygnus, Cygnus the Swan with um, Vega, Lyra, Altair. So uh, a lot of, again, I, I could have went a little bananas here on the, on the contrast, but this was about 20 minutes of, uh, of frames. No, sorry, 12 minutes of frames got stacked together. So um, North American. It's a little different when you see it in black and white, but again, it's more realistic. And that was pretty well my first attempt at some wide-angle photography from Country Skies. So again, thanks, Ralph and uh, Linda, for... Uh, Allow me to use uh, your driveway. Um, next slide, please. Um, since we were mentioning about uh, courses, I do teach at Algonquin College. I teach in a, a beginner's astronomy course um, over six weeks. It's on Wednesday nights from 7 to 9.30. And the course will commence on September 17th. And it's pretty well just a potpourri of just your basic getting your feet wet in astronomy, um, stellar evolution, how the planets were created, telescopes, photography, pretty well A to Z. Um, any old students in the audience for my course? Oh, Paul. Look what happened to Paul. Don't take my course. Don't take my course. So this is right on, on my website. And uh, uh, one more thing tomorrow, too, on my website is uh, wondersofastronomy.com. Uh, tomorrow night will be, we're trying, the first virtual worldwide star party. As you know, I do broadcast from my observatory. But a lot of other people around the world are doing the same thing. Denmark, across the U.S., Australia. So what we plan tomorrow is each have their own turn showing the sky in 24 hours. How our Denmark does look like they're going to be cloudy. But uh, first, virtual. Uh, I will be on here from Ottawa starting at 8 p.m. Eastern showing the moon and Jupiter if Mother Nature will allow. So uh, any further questions, please see me later. Okay, super. Thank you. Okay. Oh, the little button on top? Yes. Um, the pictures you've just seen are planned and very good. What's kind of neat is when something doesn't work. This is a tracked photograph. I was tracking the stars, uh, but it was a relatively warm night. I was actually trying one of these thermocell mosquito repellers and things, and they work phenomenally well. You could uh, wear shirts, uh, just t-shirt and short pants, and you'd, no bugs would get at me at all in the observatory until I stepped outside to take wide angle pictures and then I'd be eaten alive and I'd rush back into the observatory where the thermocell thing was and it would be perfect for the rest of the night. But it was a very warm night. One trouble with warm night is the grease in my friction clutch gets kind of droopy. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> it was fine the previous week. It was a nice cool night, something like 5 or 10 above. Well, now it was about 20, 25 above and it didn't drive. Darn. Well, I had this, um, my DSLR on the telescope mount with a 135 millimeter telephoto lens. They get a neat picture of, of Quilla and, and, this, and, this, and Scutum and M11 and so on and the star clouds and dark nebula and all that sort of thing. So I took um, a relatively short exposure to see, make sure it was framed right, only to find, to my dismay, that all the stars weren't points. And also the focus is a bit off, but I could fix that. That's why you do test exposures. I was using an old, not a Canon lens. I was using another lens. I sort of cobbled together adapters to, to make fit in the camera. So it, that's the reason for the blur. But what was interesting is you don't, it was a, 
it was a mistake, not a mistake, but it was a oops, oh well, you erase it and you, you go on and do the next one. Well, I didn't erase it until I looked at it. And what we have here are, here are all the streaky stars and here are the points. Another one over there. And then there's streak in here that I didn't, I, you know, I get planes crossing all the time, satellites and so on. So I didn't pay much mind. But getting the points here, you zoom in on it and yep, they're, they're not hot pixels at all. They're, they're actually something there. So I sent it off to Mike Earl, our expert in satellites, and he identified these. All these satellites. So he put it on his website as wow, because look how many I got. One, two, three, four, five, six satellites in one oops photograph. <laughs> Now, these are, these work. Here's one that didn't. This is, a, he calls it a Breeze M, and it's a booster debris. It's, a, it's in a wayward orbit. And so I caught that one going along. Well, of course, I, I, I just took a glance. I figured, oh, darn. So I got out my sledgehammer and my, and my crowbar, and I, that's how I tighten my friction clutch, actually. <laughs> uh, People have been there, can hear this about a kilometer away, there's a rap, and it echoes throughout the dome and scares the birds and so on. But it does tighten the friction clutch nicely. And so the next one was really, really nice. I don't know if I sent the other, no, okay. Uh, so the next one was nice sharp stars. But, and what I noticed was you could see streaks here. And streaks on the other side, I think a streak on the other side, I said, hey, that's pretty neat because now I'm tracking the stars and of course the satellites would shift. Well, of course, Mike wouldn't stand for that. He had to check it out, right? So he found out that I actually got a whole bunch more satellites because these, as the Earth rotated, would have, ro uh, would have carried uh, my view. Sorry, because the telescope is driving in this direction, all these guys are out of the field of view to the left. And I got a few more with that one. And so here is with two photographs, I got, in this case, a total of six, one might argue, seven satellites. And then when I did the right thing, I actually got some more satellites at the same, uh, about 10 minutes later. So, so that's a rather remarkable image and something to be careful of. If you don't track, you actually might get more than what you're bargained for. By the way, these are out at this geostationary distance. And then so it turned out that the... Because I'm looking below the celestial equator from our latitude, that puts them out around the geostationary belt. And you can see they're pretty tightly packed out there. Okay, next slide. Uh, this is one that was uh, passed around on the light pollution list. Uh, there's a move afoot, or there's a, a pattern developing for casinos to have searchlights. So here's one on, the, they call it the, the, uh, the searchlight TP. And actually, it's below the horizon. This is from, what was it now, 40 kilometers away. So they actually go up, and then they diverge beyond. So the, the really bright portion looks like a teepee. And of course, this is on an Indian reservation, and a few others are now being built with this type of teepee that, again, of course, you can see from 40 kilometers away. They were actually promised, people were promised that they will not install these lights. And so, of course, uh, what they did is they tell the, told the press one thing and they went ahead and did it anyway because they actually fall between the cracks of jurisdictions. They can do whatever they want. And so uh, there, there's a few other casinos going up with the same idea. They tried to do this north of Ottawa in uh, the one at the, in the Gat, sorry, just north of Hull. And uh, because of some of the concern for people in Ottawa where these searchlights are going to be pa shooting over Ottawa, they actually don't, didn't put them in. So public action does affect some people, but not all. And they're still trying to uh, get, the, get them to turn off the searchlights. And there's another move afoot to put a casino somewhere near uh, outside Edmonton, right next to the Dark Sky Preserve. And there, that, that will bring in federal, provincial, municipal, as well as the RESC to try to combat that one. <laughs> okay, I've Thank talked you. enough. Thank you. Is that a question? Yes. How does your friend identify the satellites in the uh, he just knows, oh, thank you. Uh, um, he follows these things uh, with his own instrument and he photographs the satellites, determines their position at a certain time, updates the orbital elements. So what he, he's got software that downloads the current orbital elements and plots the satellites and then he just compares them to what I saw. And of course there's some things that are a little bit off and thank you very much, he updates the orbital elements and sends it down to NORAD or wherever they send them. Okay, we'll have to get thank you.
This is a, uh, a slightly unusual view of the moon. Uh, this is actually the picture I snapped uh, late last year, uh, just for fun. And then I was uh, processing some images on my computer uh, last month, and I thought, hey, you know, let's um, see if I can do something with the moon. And I thought of just trying to boost the color saturation. And so I pushed the color saturation up, and sure enough, you can see all kinds of interesting uh, color. There's uh, brownish areas and bluish areas and such on the moon. So it actually does have some color after all. You don't, shouldn't just use black and white film on it. Uh, the other pictures I've taken are um, all from last weekend. The long weekend we had some beautiful clear weather. Um, the scope I use for this picture and all the other pictures is um, FSQ106 from Takahashi. It's a four inch F5 refractor. Um, the camera for this one was a 20DA uh, digital SLR from Canon. Uh, the rest of them were taken with an Orion Starshoot Pro. Uh, go ahead. Uh, the exposures range from about 22 minutes to 95 minutes, depending on the shot. I have a list if someone really wants to know, but I, I don't think I need to go into details. This is the Lagoon Nebula, Messier 8. Um, the Lagoon part is there, although you know, with this sort of deep exposure, you kind of wonder why they bother calling it the Lagoon Nebula. And then over here is the Triffid M20. And uh, so this is just, uh, actually I was going to shoot M8, and I realized I could squeeze in M20 into the shot, so I just uh, pushed over the telescope a little bit and, uh, and got that in as well. Uh, next, please. The uh, Eagle Nebula M16. Um, the pillars of creation are right there, but they're not very big. This is a, a fairly wide field shot, but you can see nebulosity going th all through the bottom of the picture, which is kind of interesting. Uh, next, please. Pinwell Galaxy M33. Uh, you can see some uh, H2 regions, just like the uh, mission nebulas I was showing in the previous pictures. That's, uh, of course, in a different galaxy. Uh, next, please. The Pleiades, yes, uh, winter is coming, I'm sorry to say. Uh, this was taken this weekend. Um, the Merope Nebula, of course, you can see actually there's reddish areas down in the lower parts of it here, but there's some bluish nebulosity around all the stars. So it's a really pretty object with a deep picture. Uh, next, please. Veil Nebula. And so you can see both uh, blue and red components. It's very turbulent. This is an old supernova remnant uh, up near Cygnus. And it extends, so you can see tendrils extending out this way and down here. There's also a little nebulosity here as well. Uh, next, please. Uh, the North American Nebula. So here is the uh, Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico here, hurricane here. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Mike Worth is over here somewhere. <laughs> uh, interesting colors. Uh, maybe it doesn't show as well on the big screen, I'm not sure, but you get, you get a bit of a gradient in colors. It's more red, uh, pinky up here, and it goes more magenta as you get down where there's more dust extinction. So it's kind of also kind of interesting to see the subtle variations in color. Bluish here, very red magenta there. Uh, next, please. There's a little bit of a closer up of the Andromeda galaxy. Um, you can see, of course, some of the spiral arms, the core. I've adjusted this so the core is kind of not that interesting. Um, you can actually get, in the original, you can see data all the way into the core, but I wanted to emphasize the spiral arms. You can see this bluish on the outer rim. And then there's the uh, two uh, satellite galaxies, uh, M32 and NGC 205, I believe. And uh, I believe that's the last one, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, OK. A little moon token there. That, uh, that's a lovely shot of the moon. I was talking to Doug uh, earlier about that. That was beautiful. Uh, now, Paul uh, is not here this evening. So uh, I think what we'll do is, uh, is Paul going to be down next month, I guess? Do you any idea, Gary? Maybe. Uh, well, this is just a spot. Uh, using his 14-inch. Uh, do you want to you, you talk about it? This is what I like doing to Gary, you know. I, uh, I remember years ago, it was probably about 15 years ago, uh, I was uh, chairing the meeting at Carleton University and uh, none of our speakers showed up that, with the slides. And I always kept a rack of slides with me. So I talked to Gary and I said, uh, listen, I got a bunch of uh, mishmash of deep sky slides. Can I just throw them on? Can you talk to them? That's what he did. Just came in cold. So here we go again, redux. Okay, well, Paul's using a, um, he's got his new uh, CCD camera. I think it's an STME. I think it's 1100, which is like a really big uh, uh, CCD chip on it, and he's using a, uh, a Mead 14-inch SCT in his, in his observatory in his house in Barhaven, and he's, he's only been at it uh, 
what is this? He hasn't even been out of the year yet. And he's just trying out this new camera. So he's, he's been going after these pretty faint uh, galaxies and um, clusters and things like that. So he's got a nice face on uh, spiral, um, NGC 6560. Uh, let's have another slide. Let's see what else he's got here. Okay, this looks like a, uh, it's a globular. I got this one right here. This is in um, Constellation Aquila. It's a magnitude 12th uh, globular and it's four arc minutes in diameter. And what else has he got down here? And there's his exposure time, 30 seconds. And he has uh, taken just uh, about a month ago. And this is very close to another globular, which is quite a bit brighter, 6760 in Aquila. Okay, there's a nice, beautiful edge on a Draco. Um, so the picture that Ro, uh, was shown earlier um, by Doug with the galaxy on a tilt, and you can actually see the spiral arms. This is a similar type of galaxy, but we're going more sideways. So it's being, instead of being like this, it's sort of rotated sideways. Edge and edge on. Um, and this is a, and you can see the dust lane running right through the middle of that. And then it's the, the central nucleus uh, right in the center. Now this is one that uh, this is one that uh, Paul did for in response to the observing challenge from the month before, so that's one of the images there. Yeah, All very right. nicely done. Excellent. Okay, is that is that it, <coughs> Paul? You got a laser there? Yeah. Right okay. Yeah, this is uh, M33, the pinwheel galaxy. Uh, you saw an image of it before from uh, uh, Doug George. Um, it's bigger. It's bigger than my field of view, uh, by quite a margin. And uh, some of the H, the, the uh, H2 stuff shows up. There's red showing up in different areas in the galaxy. And uh, I looked it up on the net, and there's a. Um, they found a black hole here, and unfortunately, the article didn't say where the black hole was, and it's uh, it's orbiting a star. And it's about 15 times. Uh, the mass uh, of our sun, the black hole is, and it orbits the uh, a star uh, every two, every th every uh, three and a half days, and eclipses that star. So they they know they, it was the first one of the first black holes they actually spotted. Okay, next one. Uh, I saw a picture of this and just thought it was really neat, so I uh, uh, just took a picture of my own. It's in Cepheus, and uh, right in the very middle is a massive hot uh, young star. And the light, the reason it's blue is the light is being reflected off of the dust that's in this, uh, surrounding this star. Uh, the star, the dust probably formed the star. And uh, there's, a, a complicated, there's a complex carbon chains uh, in this dust that they have, um, uh, they use infrared uh, telescopes to spot. So they're, they're, there's a carbon uh, floating around in there also. Okay? That's a gorgeous image. Yeah. This one here is the challenge object, M27, and um, uh, this is uh, about uh, 1,300 light years away, and um, uh, you can see the, 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 what would you call that, turquoise, a, sort of a bluey green here and here, that's from oxygen, and the red is from uh, the hydrogen, ionized hydro hydrogen. Uh, it, my filter wheel... Um, is very interesting. Uh, so it, uh, if, you, if this was a graph of the filter wheel, this is my blue, and it goes like this, and my green goes like this, and misses that. <laughs> so this is a, a really long exposure to get a pathetic green. Uh, uh, the problem has been corrected by Albert Sakley, who has uh, donated to me uh, the filters that actually the green overlaps and the blue overlaps. So I'll, my next picture will be fabulous. Why does it say not M27? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's very intentional. Yes. The challenge last month was not to get M27, but to get specific details around it. Oh, very good. Okay. I have no idea. I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do I know? Uh, this is the other challenge object, and uh, actually Paul commissions 20-second exposure is better than mine. Um, but what's interesting about this is, is that this is a warped galaxy. It's not a straight line. You know, this one bends this way and this one bends that way. I, I'm looking at sideways. Maybe I've got the bend the wrong way. But it's a slight bend to it. And what happened, well, I guess they're making a guess. 
but some other ga smaller galaxy came flying through here and spiraled in uh, and sort of distorted the, the galaxy as it did that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay. Now, what we've done here is uh, we pulled up yours, uh, Bob, with, uh, with Paul's, just to, just to show you a, a comparison. Uh, I've got them down. Uh, we've got them at the, yeah, they're at the same scale. Eh? Yeah. And, so that, and one has been rotated. Oh, yes, we flipped, uh, we flipped Paul's to, so to be, match the same orientation uh, as Bob's here. And uh, you see the difference in the, uh, the way the detail has been, uh, has been pulled out in the, in the two. Uh, how long was your exposure? Bob? Probably, uh, two, hours. two hours. And Paul's was what? 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Wow. <laughs> but, but we were looking at these, uh, Chris and I were looking at these quite carefully, and there is a heck of a lot more detail that is visible here. I mean, some of it, you know, may uh, almost be overpowering, but what, what, the, what you're getting for that is some of the other detail uh, in the background here. But it was a nice comparison, and uh, we'll save this for, uh, for Paul to have a look at if he's here next month, all right? So he can have a good look at that, too. All right. Okay, Attila. So we're just getting very close to the end here, just our challenges and, uh, and we're done. The Great Ring Nebula. This is a very popular object to look at. Has anyone here seen it? Okay. Has anyone here seen it more than 10 times? Has anyone here seen it more than 100 times? Okay. So that is the point of this. Because I look at this basically every time that it's up. And after hundreds of nights looking at it, I discovered to my absolute amazement that there's all kinds of other things in the same high power field that I never thought to look for. Can you see it? There's actually 100 million stars here. I can give you a better view of it. And the other interesting thing is this frame by increasing the aperture slightly. Oh, so M57 is not the challenge because everybody's seen it. <laughs> so when I title the slide next time, not M57. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> the central star isn't part of the challenge either because just about everybody knows about that. Instead, let's zoom in a bit. Now you can see that that little smudge is a very nice 15th magnitude uh, uh, barred spiral galaxy. And something interesting has happened around M57. There's a massive gas around it. <clears throat> Think about it. Planetary nebulas are formed by uh, old stars, like old people have difficulty holding on to their gas envelopes. <laughs> and they kind of release them in these, these impulse events. But they do it more than once. They do it kind of repeatedly, and possibly very annoyingly, to adjacent stars. <laughs> M57 has done this several times. The bright ring that we see is only the most recent explosion. What we're seeing here is the beginnings of uh, an older explosion. And on deeper photographs, I've seen uh, two outer shells. <coughs> now you're wondering if it's possible to see these things, and it is. Um, the Bard Spiral Galaxy is called IC1296. And uh, I've seen it many, many times in my 25 inch. Occasionally, I can't see it at all when the transparency is poor, but I figure it can be seen in a 20. Um, the outer halo is surprisingly visible even in medium-sized uh, telescopes. I was observing it last uh, weekend uh, at uh, my observatory with my 25-inch, and John Douglas was there with his 9.5, and, and once I showed it, showed it to him in my 25, he could see it. He could just barely detect it in his 9. So I'm guessing that somebody who hasn't seen it before can detect it perhaps in a 12. Now what you're looking for is to observe the edge of the planetary nebula and observe that it's brighter than the background sky. And I've seen this thousands of times, or maybe hundreds of times, and it never occurred to me that it was part of the nebula because I'm so used to seeing sharp-edged photographs of M57. So the way to convince yourself that you really can see another halo is go look at a different planetary nebula where it's much more obvious. Try looking at the Cat Eye Nebula, which, uh, and it's a little ob more obvious there because the outer halo of the Cat Eye Nebula is asymmetrical. So it's very obvious to see it. <clears throat> Uh, and then go look at NGC 40, which is a planetary nebula in Cepheus. It has no outer halo at all. And if you compare the, those two uh, planetary nebula back and forth, you'll get an idea of what to look for. And then go back and look at M57. You may have to do this over more than one observing night, because I'm not sure all three of them will be up simultaneously. <clears throat> but it is a challenge, after all. 
<clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so let me just summarize here. There's actually um, three challenges in the same high power view. You can do this all with one eyepiece. The uh, outer halo of M57, uh, try using at least a 12 inch telescope and good transparency. <laughs> Maybe look at a couple of their planetary nebulas for, uh, for reference. Try to have a look at IC1296, which is uh, detectable with averted vision in moderate sized telescopes. And the last <laughs> challenge, <laughs> last ch 20 inches, moderate size. Good finder. Um, the last can be done with a fairly small telescope, eight inches. Um, and I didn't want to point it out to you because it's obvious if you see it in a photograph, but literally people have looked at, at M57 hundreds of times and not noticed that one of the stars within one radius of M57 is a double star. Has everybody noticed that? I looked at it literally hundreds of times. You thought, oh, crap, there's a double star there. What the hell have you been doing all these years looking at M57 and not looking around? So that's why. So this challenge is about seeing things that you should have seen but or hadn't noticed before. Um, oh, yeah, one more thing. I'd like to propose a photography version of this challenge just to be annoying in my tradition for ast towards astrophotographers. I'd like to see an astrophotograph of F57 showing uh, detail in the bright portion of the ring, plus showing the spiral arms of IC1296, and showing preferably two outer halos of M57, and having enough resolution for the double star somewhere around F57. <laughs> I'm hoping somebody will go out and buy a 20-bit camera to do this. You are one irritating guy. That's going to be... <laughs> And I have a star for you here. I'll pass it down in a second. All right, Lunar Challenge. We're going back to the University of Western Ontario in London. Back to London, right? Back to the future. Back to that moon map. All right, this is a large uh, photograph of the moon. Uh, does anybody see what's going on there? Any ideas what's going on there? So it's a mosaic. Yeah, it's a mosaic. And it's actually, it's, it, you've got the two chunks here, but there's also pieces that have been put in like this. So it's real, a real stitch together, right? And this is uh, this is nothing from a digital uh, digital photography. This is all, uh, no, if you want to call it normal photography. There's another piece that comes in here, and uh, any reason uh, anybody know why they did it that way? Right. So you're getting the shadows. What's happening is uh, when you have the uh, first quarter moon, you're getting all this low shadow relief. But when you get to a full moon, you're getting a direct uh, beam of sunlight on it. You don't get that much shadow relief. So the trick is you just take the other half and wait for the sun to be illuminating from the other side. And if we go to the next uh, shot there, Chris, so just a bit zoomed in there, you can see, uh, if you look, you'll see that, uh, say, a crater here. Notice which side the shadow's on? And which side the shadow's on over here? All right, so it's a trick. So the lunar challenge is to create your own mosaic of the moon. It can be a sketched mosaic because you've sketched it at the two phases, at the at the two uh, yeah at the two phases. Uh, it can be a digital image. It could be a photograph that you've uh, that you've blown up and uh, photocopied and uh, connected with tape, and you're going to drag it up to the front here. We'll all have a look at it. This will be fantastic. So that's the lunar challenge for the next month. All right. And guess what? We're done. Uh, Observatory is closed tonight because it's uh, I believe it's still overcast. Uh, out there, 130, uh, 130 of us got together for a bit of fun, I hope, tonight. All right, the Stanmont Library, which is on the other side of the bulkhead right here. That's a Navy talk for you. All right, Estelle Rother, uh, our librarian, will be there. Okay, uh, Al Scott, our first presenter, uh, who is talking about his some summer vacation, has uh, some, some equipment that's available for, uh, for loan. And we have uh, uh, if memberships. You can talk to Art Fraser. He's just sitting in the beam of light. Uh, I'll, I'll put on the deck head here, just below there. All right. And, uh, and Art and Ann Fraser uh, have brought all the uh, drinks and snacks that will be out in the lobby there. So you just throw a donation into the pot. And, uh, and uh, let's have some good chit chat, OK? And uh, hey, we'll see you on October 3rd. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the presenters. This is wonderful. Thank you.